Broom Mates, See Witch Cozy Mysteries, Book One, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Chapter One I stood at my office window, looking through the sudden storm at the Yarra River far below. It wasn't a pretty sight, fondly known as the river that flows upside down, due to its thick brown colour, but it was no less an icon than the Melbourne cricket ground. Melbourne was arguably the cultural capital of Australia, albeit one where people didn't ask your name upon introduction, but rather which football team you followed. Thomas's voice droned on behind me. I don't know why you're so suspicious, Goldie. I only promoted Alexis over you because she has people skills, whereas you don't. I had seen her people skills firsthand, kissing Thomas in his office only minutes earlier. I'm the best salesperson in this office, I snapped. I have people skills. Thomas held up his hands in a gesture of surrender. Not for Melbourne, you don't. That's why I've decided to send you to the Gold Coast to manage the new office in Southport. I hope this won't intrude upon our personal life. Our relationship can easily change to long distance. He trailed his finger across my cheek. I'll fly to Queensland every weekend to be with you. I slapped his hand away and considered throwing the paperweight on my desk at his head. Until moments ago, I had been happy with my life. A successful career, a one-bedroom apartment in Chapel Street, right in the centre of trendy inner-city suburb Paran, and dating the owner of a successful real estate firm. I quit. Thomas reached for my shoulder but hesitated. You don't mean that. I understand why you're upset, but nothing's changed. Everything's changed. I shook my finger in his face. I'm giving notice, as of today. As of right now, in fact. I pulled out one of my desk drawers and tipped the contents onto my desk for emphasis. You legally have to give five weeks' notice he said, but I held up one hand. The fact I just saw you kissing Alexis in your office relieves me of that legal duty, I believe. I'm sure the Real Estate Institute would love to hear about you promoting her over me. Thomas turned white. That was nothing, nothing, he stammered. She tried to kiss me, but I pushed her away. That wasn't at all what I had seen, but I was too upset to get into it right now. I'll go into business for myself. I'm fully licensed. Thomas laughed. I'd be surprised if you have enough savings to set up a business. You have expensive tastes. He gestured to my clothes. Office rent in the city costs a fortune. I'm sure you could only afford an office in the outer suburbs, and I know you're a city girl. Look, you'll love the Gold Coast, and you'll be in charge of the whole office. Mrs. Winters, the head secretary, poked her head around the door. Sorry to interrupt, Miss Bloom, but there's a lady here to see you. I looked up, surprised. I don't have any appointments this afternoon. Anyway, I've just quit, I added dramatically. Mrs. Winter's jaw dropped. She's a lawyer. She says it's urgent, that you're in danger of missing a deadline. A deadline? I echoed. I was entirely mystified. Okay, then, show her in. Thomas leant over and whispered in my ear. Goldie, you know you don't have a choice. I'm sending you to Queensland for your own good. It's a great career move for you. He winked at me before leaving the room. Mrs. Winters showed in a tall woman whose attitude was as tightly wound as her skirt. I'm Miss Finch, she said in a nasal tone, from Fortescue and Fife. I gestured to the chair in front of my desk. Please have a seat. Before I could open my mouth, she continued. I have sent several letters, but you have not responded. My eyes went straight to my overflowing inbox tray. Right on cue, the top envelope fell to the ground. I retrieved it and said, Oh, yes, I'm a little behind with snail mail. Who uses snail mail these days? I do, she snapped. You have until five today to sign for your inheritance, otherwise it will pass to the next in line. My ears pricked up. Inheritance, you say? I didn't know I had an inheritance. Her lips pursed tightly. That is because you did not read our correspondence. 
she said slowly and carefully, as if speaking to a willful child. I didn't know there was anyone who would leave me money. Are you sure it's for me? She looked down her nose at me by way of response. Peter Proteus was your uncle. It was a statement, not a question, but I nodded. After my parents passed away, I tried to find him. I do remember visiting him as a child. He was my mother's brother, but he'd spent the last few years in Europe, I believe. He's dead. He left you his entire estate. That's hardly a way to break the news to me gently, I admonished her. I've already had one shock today. Miss Finch appeared oblivious to my rebuke. She shoved some papers across my desk, dislodging some of the items from my drawer as she did so. Sign here. I eagerly read the first page of the document. I sure hoped Uncle Peter had left me some hard cash. To my delight, he had, although not enough to start a new business, and he had left me a house as well. I looked up to see the lawyer impatiently drumming her fingers on the table. East Buckleberry, I said. Where on earth is that? Gold Coast, she said. North Gold Coast, to be precise. Small seaside town. Your uncle left you a house by the water. I slumped back in my seat, shocked. Gold Coast? Exactly where Thomas wanted to transfer me. And a seaside house? I had always wanted to live by the sea. Everything happens for a reason, right? Instead of trying to start my own business here in Melbourne, I could accept Thomas's transfer. There's only one catch, she added. I rubbed my forehead. I knew it was too good to be true. I flipped to the next page. What's the catch? She stubbed her finger on the document. You have to live there for a year. I was at once relieved. That's fine. I waved one hand at her. She sighed. If you had let me finish, I was going to say that you have to live there for one year with a roommate. A roommate? I said, horrified. Chapter Two Thomas had been right. I wasn't a people person. In fact, I far preferred animals to people. I could watch plenty of movies where people were killed, but I could not bear to watch a single movie where an animal was harmed. Give me animals over people any day. I'm not good with people, I told her. Miss Finch arched one eyebrow. Those are the terms of the inheritance. Hang on a moment, is this any roommate of my own choosing? She tapped the papers once more. There is a particular roommate already in residence. Is it a frail and elderly or perhaps sick person? I asked, clutching my throat. Do I have to be a caregiver? Miss Finch was clearly becoming impatient with my questions. No. Or is it a child? I can't do children. They don't like me, and I don't like them, I added for good measure. Miss Finch's lips formed a thin line. I can assure you, Miss Bloom, that Purse Nickel is neither an elderly person nor a child. He is entirely independent, according to your uncle's instructions. You simply need to provide food and board. My mind ran through the possibilities. Maybe Persnickel was a young man my uncle had taken in out of the goodness of his heart. Or maybe he was his gay lover. Who would know? I'm sure I would find out soon enough. I looked through the contract and saw that Persnickel did not have a surname. Or maybe that was his surname. Perhaps he was one of those artsy types. Oh well, so long as he kept to himself and didn't complain about my cooking. I held up one finger to the woman. Just a moment. I turned to my iMac and punched in East Buckleberry. The first entry was East Buckleberry Waste and Recycling Centre. I scrunched up my nose and clicked on the second entry. City of Gold Coast, East Buckleberry. My jaw dropped open when I read of the luxury resort, the deep water marina and the pristine beaches, as well as the nearby uninhabited island. It didn't take me long to decide. I had always dreamt of a home by the sea. There were two drawbacks, the first being the roommate Persnickel, and the second being that an outlying suburb of the Gold Coast was hardly big city life. I looked at the amount of money once more, and then signed as fast as I could.
Chapter 3 The past five weeks have been a whirlwind. I had given notice on my tiny apartment, hired a removalist, and was on my way to East Buckleberry. It was a four-day drive through three states, so I tingled with excitement when I finally crossed the border into Queensland. I had attended conferences at the Gold Coast and had always liked it. Still, I had never considered living there. I hoped I wasn't making a mistake. But Thomas had made it abundantly clear that I wasn't able to keep my old position in Melbourne. My stomach tingled with anticipation when my GPS showed I had only 20 kilometres to go. I had spent the last few days wondering what my house was like. It didn't show up on Google Street View. Some of East Buckleberry houses did appear online and were veritable mansions, each worth well over $2 million. My house was not so grand. After all, Mrs. Finch had informed me that it needed some work. That didn't worry me. I had always wanted to renovate a house. My lawyer, at my request, had hired a builder to take care of any urgent work, and I figured I could press this personical guy into helping me do the minor work. I drove between sugarcane fields for about 15 kilometres and turned right onto a road boasting that East Buckleberry was only five kilometres away, the town itself, was a huge letdown. It was cutesy, if you liked barely inhabited and cosy little towns, and I didn't. I guess the population was only around 2,000 people. There were more people in my old street in Melbourne. I wasn't fond of people, but with people came convenience. I took a deep breath and continued through town, so far, I had only seen old houses that looked over a hundred years old. These houses were not renovated, and most were ramshackle. I could see no beach, no marina, not even a resort. Thankfully, the derelict houses gave way to the huge houses I had seen online. Towering constructions of concrete and glass, with high security fences and electronic gates, the very epitome of luxury, it was with high hopes that I continued down the street. It only took minutes to arrive at my new house. While it was no towering concrete and glass mansion, it was a Queenslander, one of those beautiful homes built since Victorian times for the subtropical climate. I had only seen them online and in magazines, but this one looked typical, the living spaces all built above ground to allow airflow under the house and to keep snakes out. It had the wide wraparound veranda, as well as the traditional casement windows and double-hung windows that were typical of the best of Queenslanders. It was not a beachside property. On the other side of the road was the sea, only there was no surf and no beach, not unless you counted a strip of sand. I felt cheated. After all, Australia was famous for its beaches. As far as oceans went, it was a disappointment. I'd had the romantic notion of waves crashing on a pristine beach, but this water was flat. Even an ant couldn't surf here. I got out of the car and took one step, my heel at once wedged in the mud. I threw out my hands to save myself and fell unceremoniously face forward in the mud. I said a few rude words and struggled to my feet. I ripped my shoe out of the mud, but the heel had partly detached. I put it back on as best I could and hobbled over to the house, straining against the blustering wind. I tried the front door, but it was locked. The builder was supposed to meet me here and give me the keys. Hello? There was no response. I called out again. Still nothing. I hobbled around to the back of the house. A vehicle was parked out the front, and considering it had an extension ladder strapped to the roof, I figured it belonged to the builder. So where was he? I snatched my mobile phone from my handbag, and as I did so, my keys flew out and fell through a crack in the old boards of the veranda. I tried to flip on the torch on my iPhone, but my phone was flat. Great. Now I was stuck here without keys at dusk, and I had locked myself out of my car. I had no hope of retrieving the keys. It would take tools to do that. I surveyed my surroundings. There were only two houses as far as the eye could see, mine and the house next door. 
After a good five minutes of knocking on the neighbour's door, I had to accept that no one was home. I had no option but to break into my house. But that proved impossible. Who says country people don't lock their houses? A SWAT team wouldn't have been able to get in. Every window was secured. Given that it was almost nightfall, I weighed up my options. It was too far to walk to town in the dark, so I would have to stay here. I looked behind the house to see if there was some sort of shelter I could use. It was then I spotted the tent. I knew nothing about tents. After all, I had never entertained the slightest wish to go camping. The tent was rectangular and seemed a decent size. I hurried over and stuck my head inside. This time, it seemed I was in luck. There was a low-slung camp bed covered with blankets next to a table and chairs. It all looked quite clean. I only hoped it would withstand the wind. I slept fitfully. Every time I woke up, the howling wind was shaking the tent. When I opened my eyes the following morning, it was bright, brighter than it should have been inside the tent. It took me a moment or two to realise the tent was gone. I saw it in the distance, billowing away on the wind. I got out of the camp bed and backed up, shielding my eyes from the sun, only to fall backwards over something and land hard. I struggled to my feet and looked around to see what had tripped me. It was the body of a man. A knife was protruding from his back. Chapter 4 I staggered back to the road like a mad thing on my one and a half heels. The only running I had done in years was on a treadmill, but somehow I made it across all the rocks and the mud. Just as I reached the road, I saw a car coming. Without thinking, I jumped in front of it, waving my arms frantically. The car veered off the road and narrowly escaped running into a drain. A man, wearing tight jeans and an angry expression, jumped out. Are you mad? He snapped. I could have hit you. Before he could get a chance to berate me further, I said, There's a dead man over there. I pointed in the direction of the body. I thought he would ask questions, but mercifully he said, Show me. I hobbled back over to the body, more slowly this time. I hung back while the man had a close look. He finally straightened and looked at me. Did you do this? I clutched my throat. No, I screeched. I arrived from Melbourne only last night. The builder was supposed to meet me here with the house keys, but he's vanished and the house is locked. That's why I had to stay in the tent. My mobile phone's flat. When I woke up, the tent blew away, and that's when I fell over him. I paused for breath and pointed to the body. Do you know what happened to him? He asked me. I was infuriated. Weren't you listening? The first thing I knew of his existence was when I tripped backwards over him. The man seemed sceptical, and I must have looked a sight, covered in mud, with a broken heel. I imagined my hair was wild, and my mascara streaked. Maybe I did look like a crazed murderer. He walked over to me, so close I could smell his soap, all coconut and lime. It was then I noticed his eyes, green-gray like holly oak leaves. I shook myself. Where were you at the time of the murder? I jabbed my finger on his chest. I could ask you the same thing. And that's the trick question, isn't it? How would I know when he was murdered? We need to call the police. Anyway, if he was murdered before last evening, I have an alibi. I left Melbourne four days ago, and I've been staying in motels every night. He pulled a notepad and pen out of his pocket. What are the names of these motels? I crossed my arms over my chest. None of your business. Now, can you call the police? I am the police. I need the names of those motels. Why didn't you tell me? I was infuriated. He quirked one eyebrow. Tell you what? That you're a police officer? I just did. Detective Max Grayson. And you are? We stood there, facing each other. I wasn't a morning person, and normally I would have had plenty of coffee by this time of day. Finally, I said, Goldie Bloom. I realised he was going to ask me about the motels again, so I added, I'd have to look at my iPad. My hand flew to my mouth. 
Oh no, they're in the car and I'm locked out. I dropped my car keys under the porch and it'll need to be partly demolished to get them. The detective merely raised his eyebrows. No doubt he thought I was some sort of idiot city slicker at best, and at worst, a murderer. I'll have to make some calls and then you can come to town with me. Lucky me, I muttered sarcastically, a little more loudly than I intended. He looked pointedly at my shoes. Don't you think it would be a good idea to change into sensible shoes? Yes, that is a good idea, Sherlock, I snapped. But my sensible shoes are locked in my car. I don't know if I imagined it, but I thought his lips twitched slightly. On second thoughts, let me see if I can open the house for you. He escorted me back to the front door, his hand under my elbow. At that moment, a white bus came around the corner and screeched to a halt outside my house. The words, East Buckleberry Aged Care Services, were emblazoned along the side in a flowing green font. The driver stuck her head out the window. What's happened here? Has there been an accident? I've just moved to town, I called back. I inherited Peter Proteus's house. He was my uncle. The driver looked surprised, but before she could respond, the folding doors opened, revealing a man and a woman. Both were tall and slender, and both had wild grey hair. Detective Grayson, the woman said. I hardly think that's a police emergency. I was surprised to see the detective's cheeks flush red. Well, there's been a murder. His remark was met by a collective shriek from within the bus. I thought it strange that neither the man nor the woman looked surprised. Detective, have you met our driver, Harriet Hemsworth? She's just moved to the retirement home. The two nodded to each other. The woman turned her attention to me. And you must be Goldie Bloom. Your dear uncle told us all about you. I'm Oleander Blanche, and this is a friend of mine, Athanasius Chadwick Pryor. The man bowed slightly. And who was murdered, detective? Grayson shrugged one shoulder. The local officers will be here soon. For now, I assume he's a builder. He pointed to the vehicle. My hand flew to my mouth. Of course, he was working on my house. That's Nat Jeffrey's ute out the front, Athanasius said. Don't tell me he was the victim. A collective gasp went up from the group. I'm afraid so. Did you know him? Oleander and Athanasius exchanged glances. Poor Nat was a bit of a loner, Oleander said. He wasn't a local, so he'd camp here whenever he had work in town. There are no builders in town, and he worked cheap. You've had a terrible shock, dear, Athanasius said. We should take you inside and settle you in. Does anyone mind? We can go on our little outing after Miss Bloom is settled. The detective took no time in picking the lock on the front door, and the people from the retirement home filed in. I was about to follow them when another car pulled up. A woman jumped out and hurried over to me. You must be Goldie. I'm Laura. Sorry I wasn't here to meet you. I sized her up. She seemed to be my age, possibly a little younger, and unlike me, was not covered with mud. In fact, she was rather well-groomed. So this was the mysterious Persnickel. It must be her surname, after all. The woman held the door open wide and returned my stare. Whatever happened to you? Came here, fell in mud, camped overnight in a tent, woke up, found a dead body, spoke to police, need coffee and a shower. The detective scowled. I'm afraid there's been a murder. The victim appears to be the builder who was working on the house for Ms. Bloom. She looked shocked, but recovered her composure rather quickly. Why don't you have a shower while I make you a hot drink? There are towels and stuff in the bathroom. Help yourself to anything. A third door on the left. I thanked her, asked for black coffee and something to wear, and stepped inside. I was pleasantly surprised. This roommate arrangement might work out after all. I gasped when I saw the interior. It was charming. High ceilings, polished timber floors, delightful fretwork and through the bedrooms either side of the hall, I could see French doors opening onto the deck. 
The bathroom was more Federation in style than Victorian, but did have a lovely clawfoot bath. And what's more, there was a heavenly vanilla and caramel scented candle. I ripped off my clothes in my haste to get into the shower. As refreshing as the shower was, I was desperate for coffee, so shampooed and conditioned my hair and cleansed my face as fast as I could. After quickly toweling myself dry, I put on the skirt and blouse Laura had poked around the door. I quickly applied some makeup and dried my hair. A quick glance in the mirror showed I was almost back to my old self. Laura greeted me with a wide smile. Are you going out? No, I didn't know what she meant. It occurred to me she might think I was wearing too much makeup, given that she was wearing jeans and a t-shirt and her face was freshly scrubbed. I would have to get used to these quaint country ways. Would you like some breakfast? She made to rise from her chair at the kitchen table, but I waved her back down. Just coffee, please. Where are the others? She nodded to the large mug in front of me. The police have just arrived and the detective is out there speaking to them. I assume they've all gone outside to eavesdrop. She chuckled. I thought my uncle's house was beachfront, I said. Yes, it is, sort of. There's a road between you and the beach. But there are no waves. East Bucklebury is a canal town, Laura explained. The broad water, that is, the body of water between us and the island over there, is deep, but the surf breaks on the other side of the island. I nodded and lifted the cup to my lips. Milliseconds later, I gagged. What was that? I managed to say after swallowing the vile liquid. It had taken all my willpower not to spit it out. Laura looked surprised. Coffee? Isn't that what you wanted? Anyway, we must be careful. Coffee is illegal in this town. It's due to an old trade agreement or something, but I don't know the details. Coffee? I echoed. Illegal? Surely she was joking. She pointed to a jar. It took a moment or two to dawn on me, and then I said, Instant! I could barely keep the horror out of my voice. Laura smiled and nodded. You're a witch. I was offended. Isn't that a bit harsh? It's just that I don't do instant. Still, the removalist will be here soon with my good coffee machine. Laura laughed. I mean, you practice witchcraft. I was impressed with her insight. How did you know? Your uncle said most of your family are witches. Well, that was news to me, and I was about to tell her so when there was a noise outside the kitchen door. That must be Persnickel, Laura said. I was aware that my jaw fell open. You're not Persnickel? I asked her. You're not my roommate. She laughed and clutched her sides. No, I live next door. Your uncle and I were friends. Look, here's Persnickel now. She pointed as the door swung open. I screamed. Chapter 5 It's a giant rat or a strange dog, I screeched, jumping to my feet and placing a chair between myself and the huge, hairy creature as it ambled towards me at a determined fashion. Laura laughed. Haven't you ever seen a wombat before? A wombat? I shrieked. Persnickel is a wombat. That wombat is my roommate. Laura appeared oblivious to my distress. He's awfully nice, she said, walking over to stroke him. You can even take him for walks on a leash. I eyed the creature warily. He did look kind of cute, in a threatening sort of way. I had always wanted a pet, but I was thinking of a dog or a cat. Having a wombat as a pet had never occurred to me. Does he bite? I asked her, after the creature opened his mouth to reveal four rather huge teeth. Only if you call him P-E-R-C-Y, she said, spelling the name. I wasn't sure if she was joking, but I wasn't about to put it to the test. How about we take our drinks to the living room, where you can get to know Persnickel in a more informal fashion? I readily agreed and sat on a comfortable armchair in the adjoining room. I was careful not to make any sudden moves. 
The coffee was vile. I wondered how far away my good coffee machine was, and I hadn't received the promised text from the removalists to say they were close. That was when I realised that my phone had no charge. I stood up, rather too abruptly, but luckily the wombat made no move to attack me. I have to plug in my phone. I retrieved my charger cord from my handbag and plugged in my phone. I walked over to return to my chair, when a shimmering mass suddenly appeared in front of me. I clutched my head. Migraine, I said. That's all I need. I fished around in my handbag for some Nurofen. I didn't get migraines often, but when I did, I had dreadful visual disturbances before the headache actually hit. This was the worst visual disturbance I'd had to date, no doubt from the stress of the last few hours. Laura sat on the edge of her seat. Goldie, what do you see? I made to respond, but the visual disturbance took the form of a person. I fell back into my seat and clutched my head. I'm having hallucinations, I said weakly. I think it was the instant coffee. Are you seeing a ghost? Laura asked urgently. A ghost? A ghost? I stammered. I took my hands from both my eyes and had another look. Yes, it certainly looked like a ghost. Not that I'd ever seen one before. The shimmering figure of a man in front of me could be nothing but a ghost. I couldn't quite take it in. It was surreal. Can you see it too? I asked Laura. There's something I have to tell you, she began in a faltering manner, but I held up one hand. Spit it out! It's because you're a witch. Once more I interrupted her. I've been a witch for years and I've never seen a ghost before. Goldie, please let me finish. Her tone was pleading. I nodded and she continued. I practice witchcraft too, but I can't see ghosts. Look, I don't know how to explain it. Okay, this is how your uncle explained it to me. You're from an ancient coven of sea witches. The room was starting to spin. I dragged my eyes away from the ghost and put my head between my legs. I didn't want to faint in case the wombat ate me. Sure, it didn't seem likely, but I was having one of those days. You're kidding, I managed to say. Undaunted, Laura pushed on. You're a sea witch, and Persnickel is your familiar. When he's around, you can see ghosts and communicate with them too. I've never seen a ghost before, I said. That's because you haven't had your familiar with you, Laura said patiently. Speak to the ghost. Is it a resident of this house? I had no intention of speaking to the ghost, but the ghost spoke to me. I started working on your house yesterday. I think I'm dead. I remember someone stabbing me. I pointed to the ghost. He's the dead man, I squealed, before I realized that all ghosts were dead. I amended that to, he's the man whose body I found this morning. He is the builder. That's terrible, Laura said in horror. I plucked up the courage to address the ghost directly. Are you Nat Jeffries? He nodded. Oh, I'm so pleased someone can see me. I remember being stabbed, but I can't remember who stabbed me. Laura was on the edge of her chair. Is he speaking to you? I nodded. He says he can't remember who stabbed him. I would think that normal, given the trauma, Laura said. Ask him if he remembers anything at all. Tell her I can hear her, he said. Laura, he can hear you. I fought the urge to break into hysterical laughter. I was translating for a ghost. The situation was crazy. I can remember something, he said, tapping his chin. I watched him with fascination, wondering why his hand didn't pass through his face. I remember in that split second, just before the knife plunged into me, whoever it was, man or woman, I don't know, said, blame your Uncle Peter. I thought that was strange, because I don't have an Uncle Peter. I jumped to my feet. 
but I do. What did he say? Laura asked me. He said he asked the murderer why, and the murderer said, blame your Uncle Peter. He doesn't have an Uncle Peter, but I do, or rather, did. Do you think it was a case of mistaken identity? I nodded slowly. That's exactly what I'm thinking. The murderer must have thought that Nat was Uncle Peter's heir. Did you know Nat well? Laura shook her head. No, I only arrived in town last month. Why would anyone want to murder your uncle's heir? Someone wants to murder your uncle's heir, came a voice. I looked up to see the detective standing at the screen door. Come in, I said automatically. I made some calls and your story checks out, Miss Bloom. Your alibi is solid. He crossed his arms over his chest. What were you saying about someone wanting to murder your uncle's heir? I carefully schooled a blank look onto my features. I didn't say that, I lied. You must have misheard me. He shot me a long, penetrating look. I figured his detective spidey senses informed him I was lying. But then again, there was nothing he could do about it. And I could hardly tell him that the presence of a wombat enabled me to see ghosts. I was still half expecting to wake up from a weird dream. I need to take a statement from you. Okay. I watched as the ghost slowly vanished. There was a commotion outside, and all at once somebody burst through the front door. Chapter 6 May we come in? Oleander said. I fought the urge to tell her that she was already in, and so were her companions. She smiled broadly. We just want to make sure you're doing okay after your fright. She, Athanasius, the driver, and the other people from the bus crowded around me, peering at me. I'm doing fine, I said, apart from having the most dreadful caffeine deficiency headache. If I don't get some good coffee soon, I'll be sick. They all headed, unconcerned for the nearest armchairs. Tea or coffee? I asked them. The coffee's instant, you know, I added, hoping I wouldn't offend Laura. Oleander shot a look at the detective. Coffee is illegal in this town, the detective frowned. Don't mind me, I'm not about to arrest anyone for drinking coffee here. I took the opportunity to study him more closely. He was good looking, not as good looking as Thomas, yet while Thomas's looks were somehow soft, the detective was attractive in a rugged way. My eyes lingered a little too long on his well-muscled arms and broad shoulders. I shook my head. What about cafes? I asked them. Oleander, Athanasius, and the other residents whose names I had forgotten all nodded solemnly. It's a wonder the lack of coffee hasn't driven us all to an early grave, Oleander said sadly. Harriet, the driver, readily agreed. I moved to town only last month, and I was surprised that not one single cafe in town serves coffee. They'll have to change the law if they want to make this a tourist destination. My head was spinning. It seemed my life had taken a strange turn and was getting stranger by the moment. I've never heard of cafes that don't serve coffee, I said. How close is the nearest decent coffee? An hour away, the detective said. I was here only a day before I had to go and buy a coffee machine. The removalists lost mine. Of course, I know it's illegal to use a coffee machine in East Buckleberry. That's where we were going when we saw you, to a cafe in Southport to get coffee, Oleander said. Is that a truck outside? She handed Persnickel a piece of carrot, and he ate it greedily. I jumped up to look out the window. Sure enough, it was the removalist. I hurried out the door and down the garden path to meet him. Oh, I tried to call, but you didn't answer, he complained. I hurried to apologize. My phone was out of battery. He motioned me to stand aside, and soon the removalist and another man were taking my furniture inside. I didn't have much. After all, my apartment had been tiny. I had a double bed, a Chinese cabinet, a treadmill, and not much else. Of course... 
The most important item was my coffee machine. I told them where everything should go. Given they weren't there long at all, it was something of an anticlimax. When I went back into the kitchen, all the retirement home residents, as well as the detective, were staring at my coffee machine. Don't get too excited, I cautioned them. It has to be plumbed in. Can anyone recommend a plumber? There's only one plumber in town, the detective said. I'll text you his number. I'll call him right now. It's an emergency. To my surprise, the plumber said he would come at once if I made him some coffee. Alas, it was too late for the others. They were all sitting around drinking their instant coffee. Harriet, the driver of the bus, leant forward. Did you really inherit this house? I nodded. I need to take your witness statement, the detective said. Athanasius stood up. Oh, I think that's our cue to leave. Miss Bloom has had a hard day and needs to rest. I'll go too, Laura said. You've got my number now, so call me later. Maybe we can have dinner together. I showed them all to the door, and to my delight, spotted a man with a toolbox halfway to my door. This had to be the plumber. I waved to him and then turned back to the detective. No one gets between me and my coffee. If you want my statement before my coffee, then you'll have to arrest me and drag me away in chains. The detective held up his hands in mock surrender. The plumber worked fast and then demanded his cappuccino. Before long, he was standing next to the machine, sipping his cappuccino and making happy sounds. Any time you want me to do any plumbing work on your house, I'll give you priority if you make me cappuccinos. I can't tell you how hard it is living in a town without coffee. I sympathized. The plumber left, and now I only had to get rid of the detective. I wanted to lie on the sofa with a cold pack on my head and do the unpacking later. I hurried back to the coffee machine and made myself a latte. Someone, presumably Laura, had stocked the fridge. Of course I had brought my own coffee. Coffee? I asked the detective. I thought you'd never ask. For a moment he dropped his frosty exterior. Almost. Two lattes each and one witness statement later, I was beginning to feel human again. Is there much crime in this town? I asked him. He shook his head. None. I don't want to alarm you, Miss Bloom. I interrupted him. Goldie, please. He smiled at me. At that moment, my stomach did flip-flops. Maybe it was because I hadn't eaten all day. You can call me Max. I don't want to scare you, but I think you were the intended victim. Me? I squeaked. It was all around town that you were expected yesterday. That is, it was around town that your uncle's heir was expected in town. No one knew your name or whether you were male or female. I tapped my chin. I see where you're going with this. The murderer thought the victim was me. Of course, I already knew this because the ghost had said as much. He nodded. Precisely. But why would someone want to murder me? Why, indeed. He narrowed his eyes. If something happens to you, who inherits? I shrugged. The wombat? Seriously, there's no one else. Well, then, I'm at a loss as to the motive unless someone had a grudge against your uncle. Something occurred to me. I don't know much about small country towns, but I've heard that everyone knows everyone else's business. The murderer didn't know the builder, whereas the retirement home people did. That means the murderer must be someone new in town. Yes, that's obvious. Oh, I said in a small voice, and here I was thinking I'd been clever. Goldie, the murderer will strike again, so you'll need to be careful. I'll arrange protection for you. I bit my lip. The wombat growled, and the ghost appeared again. Oh, I can't remember who killed me yet, he said. My stomach sank. The detective was new in town. Was it this man here by any chance? I asked the ghost. I'm sorry, what did you say? Max asked me. Just thinking out loud? I looked at the ghost, but he shrugged. Oh, I can't remember. Persnickel came over and looked at me. He wants a treat, I said. I wondered if Persnickel wanted a treat every time he channeled a ghost. 
As I fetched a slice of carrot for him, I wondered if the detective was the murderer. Was it a coincidence that he was driving down the street that day? My house was on the edge of town and isolated. I'm sure that street didn't go anywhere important. I remembered something, the ghost said. Chapter 7 What do you remember? I asked the ghost. The ghost partially faded. The person who stabbed me was someone I'd never seen before. Remember about what? The detective asked me. I thought quickly. About the victim, I said. Had you ever met him? The detective shook his head. No, I haven't been in town long. I wondered if he realized that he was implicating himself with every word. At least that was a clue. I would ask everyone if they had met Nat before. Again, I don't want to scare you, but I don't think you should stay here until the perpetrator has been apprehended. I was alarmed. What, leave my house? I only just got here. And what about Persnickel? I can hardly stay in a motel that allows dogs and pretend he's a giant chocolate Labrador gone wrong. Persnickel growled as if in agreement with my words. I tossed him another piece of carrot. Although we had only just met, I was already fond of the strange creature. In fact, he was the perfect roommate. I could watch whatever I liked on TV, and I wouldn't even have to cook for him, just provide water and special wombat food. It seemed he was even house-trained, because there hadn't been any little accidents as yet. I'll have to stay here and sleep on the sofa if you absolutely refuse to leave. Had I imagined it, or was that a flicker of annoyance on his face? I don't want to put you to any inconvenience, but I can't leave here. Someone has to look after Persnickel. Actually, I wonder who's been looking after him until now. That would be me. I looked up to see Oleander. I was about to invite her in, but she preempted me by striding into the room. I thought Laura was looking after him, I said. Oleander shook her head. I hadn't met Laura before today. I've been coming over daily to feed Persnickel and spend time with him. Did you know Nat Jeffries? I asked her. Her face fell. Yes, I knew him well. I'm dreadfully upset. I mentally ticked her off my list. Athanasius arrived and walked into the room without bothering to knock. This must be a country custom. I was about to ask if he knew Nat Jeffries when Detective Grayson spoke. Oleander was just telling us how saddened she is by Nat's death. I suppose you knew him well, too? Athanasius nodded. The detective and I exchanged glances. Oleander and I thought we should come over to mind, Goldie, just in case the murderer tries to do away with her. I wondered how Athanasius and Oleander could possibly protect me from the murderer, but I wasn't about to say so. Maybe the sea air was already improving my people's skills. The detective shook his head. He recovered his composure and said, I think it's safer if you stay away, because the murderer could harm you. More detectives will arrive tomorrow, and meanwhile I'll stay guard on the sofa here tonight. Oleander clapped her hands. Excellent. We can stay too, can't we, Athanasius? Before he could respond, there was another person at the door. This time the person knocked. Come in, I said. When she walked into the room, I recognized her as Harriet, the person who had been driving the van earlier. Athanasius and Oleander looked surprised to see her. I'm terribly sorry to come here, she said, wringing her hands in a gesture of nervousness. It's just that when you both left the retirement home, I was a little afraid, what with a murderer on the loose. I followed you here. I'm sure the murderer won't strike at the retirement home, Oleander said. I could see that Harriet's presence made her uncomfortable. I wondered how to get them all to leave, and then saw I was fighting a losing battle. Coffee? I asked. They all accepted at a rapid pace, which made me suspicious that the real reason for them being here was to procure decent coffee, rather than out of any concern for my welfare. After taking their orders, I walked into the kitchen, grateful to be away from them for the moment. I hadn't been around so many people in a long time. 
Persnickel followed me into the kitchen. I'm glad you want me for me, not for my coffee, I told him. He grunted in response. When I walked back out, Laura was sitting with the others. I didn't hear you coming, I told her. She held up two bottles of champagne. I was going to invite you for dinner, but then I saw all the cars over here, so I thought I'd bring the bubbly over. Gosh, how many more people were going to arrive at my house? Thanks, I said. I set a coffee cup in front of Oleander and one in front of Athanasius, and then said to Detective Grayson and Harriet, I'll just pop back into the kitchen for yours. After we have coffee, we can all have champagne. I'll help you, Laura said. When we were in the kitchen, she whispered to me, There's something I have to tell you. I didn't want to tell you earlier because you were so shaken up. I planned to tell you over dinner tonight, but I don't think it can wait because you could be in danger. Her face was white and drawn, and she was trembling slightly. What is it? I asked her. I prepared myself to be shocked, and just when I was settling into the idea that I could speak to ghosts and had a wombat as a familiar, oh, and that I was a sea witch, whatever that was, she touched my arm lightly. Goldie, you're from a long line of sea witches. I interrupted her. You've told me that already. Could you come straight to the point? You're scaring me. Sorry, Laura whispered. She leant closer and said, if someone kills a sea witch, then they get that sea witch's powers. I grabbed the bench top behind me to steady myself. So that's why Nat was murdered. That's why someone wants to kill me. At that moment, I realized I truly was in danger. I took a deep breath and then added, So someone would kill me just to be able to speak to ghosts. Would they steal Purse Nickel too? Laura shook her head. No, Persnickel is your familiar. So if someone murdered me, they could speak to ghosts with the help of their own familiar? Laura nodded. And they would get all your powers. Powers? I shrieked. Laura held her finger to her lips. Yes, what other powers do you have? I shrugged. I doubt I have any. How would I know anyway, because I just got here? Laura shook her head. No, no, no. The only power that Persnickel helps you with is speaking to ghosts. Well, that's not strictly accurate. He enhances your other powers. You must have other powers. I rubbed my forehead. I don't think I've got any. Laura patted my arm. Don't worry about it. I leant closer to her. But I do need to worry about it. Someone wants to murder me for my powers, and I don't even know what they are. Just then, thunder boomed overhead. I jumped. I thought the sky was perfectly clear. Laura waved a finger at me. Aha! Sea witches can make the weather do things. You know, rain, wind, that sort of thing. Have you ever noticed that when you get really upset, it rains or there's a storm or even a strong wind? I tapped my chin. Yes, I said, now that you mention it. The detective appeared in the doorway. Is that my coffee I spy there, getting cold? Oh, I'm sorry. I made to tip it into the sink, but he moved to me and took it from me. No need to waste good coffee. I'm sure it will be fine. As he took it from me, his finger lightly brushed across my hand. An electric jolt ran through my body. I had no time to ponder that, given the bombshell that Laura had just dropped. I could impact the weather? It seemed too far-fetched to be true, but only yesterday I would have thought that speaking with a ghost was too far-fetched to be true. I walked into the living room, deep in thought. You don't have any coffee, dear, Oleander said. Didn't you make yourself one? No, and I didn't make Laura one either. Would you like some coffee, Laura? She shook her head. No, but thanks. I'll have one later. Champagne? She handed me a flute. I thanked her and put it on the table in front of me. I was quite overwhelmed, and having a lot of people in the room didn't help. I needed some quiet time to sort through this. Are you all right? Harriet asked, leaning quite close to me. I edged away from her a little. 
I suppose it's all been a bit much. I looked up to see Laura smiling and laughing with the detective. She filled his glass and then drank the rest of her own, promptly refilling it. She looked up and caught my eye. Don't worry, I have plenty more at home. Now drink up, all of you. We can toast Goldie's arrival in town. I thought it improper to have a happy toast, considering a man had just died and only meet us from where we were all sitting. Still, I held my tongue. My therapist had told me that if in doubt, it was best if I said nothing. I reached for my champagne glass, but before it reached my lips, Persnickel launched himself at me. I flew backwards over my chair, my champagne flying from my hand and hitting the potted plant beside me. From where I was lying, I could see Oleander's concerned expression, but Detective Grayson reached me first. He pulled me to my feet and then released me abruptly. What was that about? I shook my head. I have no idea. Something obviously upset Persnickel. I knew instinctively that the wombat had not meant to harm me. I realized he was trying to tell me something. But what? Was there another ghost trying to come through? I heard a gasp and looked at Oleander. She was frozen to the spot, her face a mask of horror. Chapter 8 I spun around, expecting to see a crazy person with a knife, but no one was there. The plant, she spluttered. I followed her gaze. The plant, which minutes before had been a healthy, flourishing plant, was now brown and shriveled. Grayson seized me by my shoulders and pulled me away from it. Everyone sit down right where you are, he said in a commanding tone. Goldie's champagne has been poisoned. But I drank mine, Laura said, clutching her throat. And I feel all right. Someone put it in Goldie's glass. His eyes lighted on Harriet. You were sitting next to Goldie. And she hasn't been in town long, I said. Harriet stood up and backed away. I didn't do it. No one's accusing you, Grayson said, although it sounded like he had done just that. Please sit down. The murderer is someone in this room, Athanasius said somewhat unnecessarily. We all exchanged glances. A chill ran up my spine. There was a flash of lightning. It's someone who hasn't been in town long, I told the group. The murderer thought Nat Jeffries was me. Someone who had been in town for any length of time would have known he was a local builder. The murderer wanted to kill my uncle's heir. Harriet frowned. I'm not following. Why would anyone want to kill your uncle's heir? I sneaked a glance at Max Grayson, expecting him to ask the same thing, but he didn't. He did not appear the least surprised by my pronouncement. Did he know more than he was letting on? First Nickel approached, more quietly this time, and nudged my leg. Good boy, I said, stroking him. I'll give you another treat. He made his strange grunting sound as I gave him a carrot. I was in despair. How would we solve this? Someone in the room had tried to kill me, but who was it? I only knew I did not do it. Everyone else was a suspect. And what if two people were in it together? I shuddered at the thought. If only the ghost could remember. That gave me an idea. Aloud, I said, if only Nat Jeffrey's ghost was here. If only Nat Jeffrey's ghost could look at everyone sitting in this room and try to remember who murdered him. I realized I was speaking loudly, as if it would somehow make the ghost hear from wherever he was, in whatever nether region. Persnickel wandered back into the room. Can you fetch Nat Jeffrey's ghost for me, Persnickel? I said with a false laugh, making out I was joking, only I was deadly serious. To my enormous relief, the ghost slowly formed in front of me. I had to be careful what I said so the others didn't think I'd lost my mind. Okay, we know that someone in this room just tried to murder me. I pointed to the plant. That was some potent poison they put in my champagne glass. You're kidding, the ghost said. And that means the murderer is someone in this room. You're kidding the ghost said again. 
What a shame ghosts aren't real, I said, because if ghosts were real, Nat Jeffrey's ghost could have a very good look at everyone here to see if something jogs his memory. I hoped he'd take the hint, and he did, because he walked around the room, pausing to look at each person. Well, ghosts aren't real, Harriet said primly. I remember now why I couldn't remember who killed me, Nat said. Why? I asked urgently. Harriet, of course, thought I was talking to her. I don't know, she admitted. They're just not. Because I never saw anyone, Nat said. It's all coming back to me now. I did smell her perfume, however. Perfume? I said. What did it smell like? Laura stood up. Is it okay if I go to the bathroom? It was then that I knew. She's the murderer, I said. Nat agreed with me. That's what brought it all back to me. My ex-wife used to wear the same perfume. That woman's wearing it now. Laura sprinted out the door with Max hard on her heels. I went to move after them, but Oleander caught my arm. It's best if you stay here. Thunder boomed directly over us. Oleander pulled me down to sit beside her. And calm down, dear. Breathe deeply. How did you know? Harriet asked me. What did you mean about the perfume? I had to think fast. Um, I remembered that I smelled her perfume this morning when I woke up in Nat's tent. I felt bad lying, but I could hardly tell her the truth. I was saved from saying any more because Max returned with an angry Laura in handcuffs. All his hair was standing on end as if he'd had an electric shock. I figured she had used her powers, whatever they were, on him in an attempt to escape. Thankfully, it hadn't worked. I certainly hope Laura didn't murder the people next door, I said, all at once concerned. No, they sold the house and went on a trip around Australia, Oleander said. Max restrained the struggling Laura. I have to take her into custody and then come back and get statements from all of you. I'll see you three at the retirement home. Goldie, will you be all right by yourself? I nodded. I won't be by myself. I have Persnickel. Chapter 9 That afternoon I was sitting by the waterfront with Persnickel on a leash. His nose was deep in the grass, bordering the little strip of sand, and he was making horrible sounds, no doubt searching for something edible. I was doing my best to process the day's events. My life had certainly been turned upside down in the space of a few hours. I was staring out to sea when a car pulled up next to me. Oleander got out of the car and walked to sit beside me. How are you coping, Goldie? I shrugged. As well as can be expected, I suppose. Please feel free to come and speak to me at any time. I was about to thank her when she continued. I'll come straight to the point. Athanasius and I know you're a sea witch and that Persnickel is your familiar. We were good friends with your uncle. He was a sea witch and we, well, let's just say that we're witches too. I gasped. Could the day get any stranger? You, you are? And, um, you know, I stammered. She leant across and patted my hand. You're safe now, Goldie. What happened with Laura was a one-off. Please don't think that you'll be in constant danger with people trying to murder you to take your powers. I sighed with relief. Actually, I was beginning to think that might be the case. Oleander laughed. Not at all. The detective... Is he a witch? Oleander was silent for a moment. Not as far as we know, but there's something about him. I nodded. I thought so too. Persnickel came over and demanded a pat from Oleander. She smiled and then turned to me. You know, I think you'll like this town. It's your destiny, and I know it's a far cry from your life in Melbourne, but here you have friends. I thought back to my tiny one-bedroom apartment in Melbourne I'd left only days earlier. It had been a lonely existence, but at the time I thought I liked it. 
and although someone had already tried to kill me on my second day in town, East Buckleberry was beginning to grow on me. I was sure I would be fast friends with Oleander, and I had a life-saving wombat as a familiar. What more could a girl want? The End You've just listened to Broom Mates, See Witch Cozy Mysteries, Book One, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Copyright 2019 by Morgana Best. Production copyright 2021 by Morgana Best. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please consider leaving a review and recommending on social media or directly to friends and family. And keep an eye out for other audiobooks by Morgana Best. Thanks for listening.